This episode of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast is brought to you by M.G. Schlachter, a built environment and architectural consulting firm with an in-house production team. Delivering support services in the retail, hospitality, and residential sectors for leading brands worldwide, M.G. Schlachter is reinventing, something near and dear to my heart, of course, architectural support services. So look, let's say you're a worldwide fashion retailer and your new business plan calls for opening 450 new stores around the world this year. Or say you're an architecture firm and in order to grow, you need to staff up quickly to produce detailed drawing packages for your new winning project. Or dig this, let's say you're a national hospitality brand who's putting together a new line of boutique hotels and you've got to produce a massive amount of graphics, such as custom artwork, posters, or slide decks, both in digital and print. M.G. Schlachter serves architecture and interior design firms, retailers, construction companies, graphic designers, and brand managers. And with the way they're reinventing architectural support services, they offer production and strategic consulting. Their in-house production team understands the importance of accuracy and precision and can demonstrate the utmost care throughout the drawing and delivery process. And on the consulting side, their team consists of architects and international design consultants with many years of experience in design and construction. Suffice it to say that whatever built environment or architectural project you're working on, M.G. Schlachter can step in and help accelerate your growth. So, if you're looking for a built environment and architectural services firm with an in-house production team to help you reinvent your next project, check out M.G. Schlachter. Find them on the web at mgschlachter.com. That's M-G-S-H-L-A-C-H-T-E-R.com, mgschlachter.com. Hey, Revolutionaries, I'm excited to bring you this week's episode with Larice Changbian, where we're talking offshoring for the home healthcare industry. Larice has an amazing story of how she decided to leave Los Angeles, escape Hollywood. Uh, she dropped into the Philippines and went back to school, discovered love along the way, and discovered entrepreneurship. It, she's really been able to do it all the last few years, and I can't wait for you all to check it out. But before we get to the episode, I have got to let everyone listening out there in on a few things. Okay, one is that I think I'm finally over my jet lag. Yeah, I just got back from, gosh, I flew back from Sydney, Australia about a week and a half ago. And uh, I'm just about getting over the jet lag. So anyone who's uh, been traveling to the other side of the world and back knows that uh, can be a little bit brutal. But no complaints here. You know, I had an amazing time. You know, I first dropped into Chiang Mai, Thailand, uh, and attended the Nomad Summit. So I wanted to give a shout out to... All the folks I met at the Nomad Summit, thanks uh, Johnny FD, amazing group of people that are really embracing the new technologies, uh, the new world of online business, and really reinventing and being creative about um, you know their lifestyle and their independence these days. Very inspiring, I must say. If you get a chance to check it out, check out nomadsummit.com. Then after Chiang Mai, I dropped uh, down into uh, Bangkok visited some friends out there so uh, great to hang in Bangkok again and I should mention that you know my good friend that I saw out there who you know we've been friends since gosh eighth grade I think but he's been living there now he's currently the co-host of the Bangkok podcast which is for expats so if you're looking for something to listen to or to you know get some more insight on on Bangkok or Thailand check out Ed Knuth my buddy and Greg Jorgensen at bangkokpodcast.com so after about a week in Bangkok, I then had the opportunity to travel to the Philippines for the first time, and it was uh, nothing short of amazing. <laughs> it really blew me away. It was really cool. So I spent a couple days in Manila, then went to Cebu City or Cebu uh, for you know five or six days, and then ended up in Boracay, which is one of their you know beachy resort islands. Beautiful beaches and one of the best spots in the world to learn to kite surf. It was just way over the top all the experiences it, was, it really was <laughs> uh, but you know the main reason that brought me to the Philippines is the second thing I wanted to tell you about so I'm sure you noticed at the beginning of this episode was a sponsor spot for MG Schlachter and the founder of MG Schlachter Aya is from Cebu in the Philippines and so since we're working together she wanted to, wanted me to come over and check out where she's from and check out you know her businesses you know she has part of her team that's in the Philippines um, so I just wanted to give a personal shout out to Aya and say thank you for connecting me to all these great experiences in the Philippines. It really was amazing. And thank you for all the hospitality and got to meet her family and everything. 
And by the way, you know, j- this is just between us. I'm not going to tell anybody else about it. You know, nobody needs to know how fancy we were that day. But, you know, thank you for setting up that one day at the Plantation Spa. I'm not telling anybody what the name of the place was. And I'm certainly not putting the link in the show notes. So this is just between you and I and the people that are listening right now. I'm telling you, that place was off the chain. Seriously. Okay, I think I've said too much. We better get to this week's episode. Recorded while I was in Cebu. So here it is. Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, the show that explores reinvention in the digital age as it relates to career, creativity, and technology. Stay tuned for interviews with professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives that have reimagined success and are making a pivot. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalog, visit JimJim'sReinventionRevolution.com for instant access. And now, here's your host, Jim Jim. Hey everybody, this is Jim Jim, and welcome to episode 48 of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And I'm in the Philippines today, talking with Larice, and we're talking offshoring for the home health industry. So, Larice, welcome to the revolution. Hi, Jim. Thank you for having me. Hey, well, thank thank you for uh, inviting me to your offices. So, where where are we sitting right now? Tell me where we are. Well, we're we're in Cebu. Okay. Uh, and, and Cebu is a city in the Philippines, so not everybody knows the cities out here. So, yes, right? it's the second largest city after Manila. Okay. Um, and we're we're in the southern part of the Philippines, and it's actually home to a lot of outsourcing companies. And we are are happy to be one of the pioneers in the specifically healthcare segment of the outsourcing industry. And as you mentioned, we are servicing home health agencies in the United States. Right. Perfect. Well, so we're actually sitting in your offices, the offices of Cavallo. Is that how you say it? Yes. Cavallo. Okay. Cavallo. So it's a play on words. It actually means to know in our local dialect, which is Visayan. Visayan. Okay. Yes. And so we we played with the spelling QA. That's how we spell Cavallo mm-hmm. um, because that's what we do. We do quality assurance for our clients. Ah, QA. Oh, very yes. sly. I mm-hmm. like that. <laughs> very Thank good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So how do you say how do you say hello in Visaya? Give us a, like a little flavor of, of, uh, of what the language sounds like. Well, they don't really have a hello. Okay. Uh, well, they do in English. They'll say okay. hello. Right. <laughs> but they would n- typically greet you based on what time of day it is. Much like, I guess, oh, okay. in, in Spanish. Like good morning so, or So, yeah. So, maayong buntag would be good morning. Oh, okay. Maayong udto is good noon. Okay. Uh, maayong hapon is good afternoon. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, yes. these are three... Uh, greetings I need to learn. <laughs> so this is my first time in the Philippines, so I'm like really kind of blown away by everything. Yeah, so my friend Welcome. I, I, I out, here, out uh, visiting my friend Aya out here, and mm-hmm. she connected us, which I'm really happy that she did. Yes. Uh, because you have a an, uh, very interesting story. So Thank you. Uh, but I want to start out with first kind of what your business is, and then we'll rewind a little bit and, and talk about kind of how you got into it. But tell me what Cavallo is and what you're doing. All right. Well, Cavallo, we've been around for just about three years. We service, as I mentioned, home health agency clients um, throughout the United States. And we are doing both medical coding and quality assurance review for their um, medical charts. So technically, it's like an audit. So after their clinicians, their nurses, their physical therapists go out on the field and see the patients, we now go online to the EMR, the electronic medical record platform that our clients are on. And my team will do uh, a technical review of all of these medical charts to make sure that they're compliant. If we see anything that might be out of bounds, anything that might be a red flag, we will then, we have protocols in process where we will coordinate with the onshore team and make sure that it's addressed. I see. Okay, so now you specifically do this for clients in the United States, yes, correct? Yes, only the United States. O- only the United States. Yes. Okay, and and it's in this home health sector, which maybe you can explain that a little bit because I was confused as to that term. I'm not so familiar with with healthcare terminology, but what does that mean? Sure. So the the home health sector, um, under as defined by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, is actually a a sector that services patients who have needs um, that 
But because of their conditions, they are homebound. That means they cannot physically leave their homes to see a doctor at a clinic or at a hospital. And therefore, their services, um, those services are deployed to their homes instead. I see. These are okay. not life-threatening services. Okay. They're usually, you know, changing of catheters, administering medication, physical therapy, um, things that would allow them to be treated from home. I see. Okay. So as opposed to like if you're an inpatient or in a hospital, et cetera, right? Exactly. Okay. And, and because of that, you have, you have these... Um, Talk about the process a little bit. Okay, so I don't think, I, I didn't realize, you know, before we were talking earlier, like how in-depth the process can be, the medical processes can be, and how this auditing function or quality assurance part works. So I think this is actually, um, once you explain this, people will probably feel better about their healthcare experience, I hope, <laughs> that like, hey, there's there's like a second and third set of eyes kind of watching what's going on. But what's what's the process if you're a patient and you're getting home health care and you're getting services, um, how does your company fit into the process of what goes on? So we're really the back end. We don't have any direct uh, connection or interaction with the patients. Um, but we are, as you mentioned, that second set of eyes on the charts. Um, taking a look, making sure, one, from a clinical standpoint, that the nurses or the therapists are following the plan of care that has been approved by your physician. So once you're admitted into home health, you um, are put under a plan of care that is signed off on by your uh, by your physician. Excuse me. And now the nurses for the next sixty days will carry out that plan of care, and we make sure that they stay on track. Um, if there is any change in your condition that would require, let's say, coordination with your doctor, your doctor, um, updated orders, was there a change in the medication, the treatment, the dosage, we will flag that and make sure that our clients in-house teams are coordinating appropriately. I see. So when, so when the, the doctor uh, gives those orders or the nurses do a procedure, et cetera, and they document it in the States... What happens so that it gets to you for your review? Well, everything uh, is uploaded onto the electronic medical record platform. But what tends to happen, and and I think we all can relate to this because of the the basic electronification of our lives, right? right? So, right. <laughs> you know, I'll change a, an appointment, let's say, on my calendar, but I haven't coordinated it with the other parties involved. I think uh, we all okay. can relate to that, right. right? Sure. And so the same thing happens when it comes to coordinating healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps your nurse paid a visit to you, her patient, recorded that maybe there was regression in your condition and informed the doctor. Mm -hmm. Now, probably the doctor responded appropriately, changed an order, maybe changed the dosage of your medication, but did the doctor ensure that the nurse saw the note, the updated order, and right, therefore right. carried it out on her next visit? Mm -hmm. Me, I don't know about your doctor, but my doctor probably won't be following up all the time to <laughs> right. make sure. Right. Um, but he uploaded the note. He uploaded the order. Right. I right? see. Okay. And so we make sure that basically everything is in coordination and at least from a documentation standpoint mm -hmm. that that's reflected properly. I got you. Okay. So mm -hmm. that information comes to you. And I guess the interesting thing that I thought about when I heard about how your business is structured and I, I saw it when I walked in today, I was like, oh my gosh, he's got like this, uh, full room of like cubes and people answering phones. It looks, I mean, it. It is, I guess, like a call center kind of environment. But the interesting thing about it to me was these are all highly credentialed, uh, sophisticated people that you hire that have to handle this information. So tell me about who those people are in the next room over there that are answering these calls and reviewing all these charts. Yeah, so actually everything is um, just based, uh, everything's accessible online. So it doesn't even require voice coordination okay um most typically we will utilize um the the medical record platform itself mm -hmm. and now there are a lot of messaging apps so like your whatsapp or your viber okay that we use um 
day to day. I see. There are versions do do now. Do doctors use those? Or? Well, there are versions now that oh, versions are specialized for, the medical, for the medical industry. I did not know and that. And so okay. they're, they're certified to protect uh, patient health information. Okay, that makes okay? sense. Right. So we, we, and we utilize those apps here right. with our clients. Right. For privacy, right? For privacy okay. rights. Yes. And so um, to answer your question about uh, the, the, the staffing um, that we employ here mm-hmm. at Cavallo, uh, our charts, our clients charts are all reviewed and handled by registered nurses, locally registered nurses here mm-hmm. in the Philippines and um, physical therapists. Yeah, so that's that's a very um, I guess high level of service that you have. To, I guess you have to have really compliance wise to be able to review those charts, correct? Yes, okay. and, and in terms of just the clinical terminology alone, right? You have to be, you know, right. You really have to um, have the background, the proper educational background, and clinical background to understand what's happening. I see. Okay. Um, at, at the bedside. So yeah, so that's that's interesting. Kind of just thinking about this outsourcing concept or offshoring concept. Uh, you know, some people might think it's like, oh, it's for lower level labor or something like that. But this is pretty high level, uh, sophisticated stuff. Yes. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned that because um, for us specifically, um, we employ registered nurses, all registered nurses mm-hmm. to review the skilled nursing visits. But the clinicians onshore in the U.S. that are actually conducting these patient visits are maybe eight times out of ten uh, LVNs or LPNs. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. That's interesting. Okay. And so, in a sense, you could say that we have more advanced or higher level eyes looking at the charts after the visit. I see. Um, and oftentimes they'll look at me and they'll say, what's happening there? Why are they doing this? Or, you know, um, you know, why aren't they seeing what we see? And it, and we, and that's one thing that we can assure our clients of is that yes, maybe, maybe, Legally in the U.S., this type of visit can be conducted by an LVN, mm-hmm. or an LPN, licensed practical nurse or a skilled nurse. But we have registered nurses who graduated from four-year degree programs here who have two years experience in the hospital working with patients, working with doctors who are looking at your documentation. Wow, that's awesome. And that gives them peace of mind. Now, is that just a personal choice by you about in terms of Cavallo and the brand, like what you want to bring to the party? Or is it about compliance in terms of offering your service? Like, could you staff your business with LPNs if you wanted to? Or Well... Or would you feel uncomfortable From a practical standpoint, we don't really have LPNs and LVNs here. Oh, Um, the Philippines, okay. Yes. Could we... Hire people, let's say, who had just done a couple of years of nursing school and not actually graduated, perhaps, um, if they understood enough of the terminology. Um, But we are fortunate enough where there is uh, a very readily available supply of registered nurses. Right. Because they are, uh, you know, to use the term um, that our, let's say, our labor department uses. Mm -hmm. Um, They're a very high export um, skill set. I gotcha. And so universities here, it's a very popular course for people to pursue here just because the prospects for them to get jobs abroad are very high. I see. Okay, yeah, so it's highly, uh, I guess... Uh, popular, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. career path for people here in the Philippines, it et cetera. Is. But okay. one that um, has proven in recent years to become more and more difficult to pursue abroad. And so that has in turn created a very big booming industry here locally. Oh, interesting. Okay. That. Th- is that just more of like a, a sort of a visa situation or immigration situation? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, interesting. Okay. So that's, mm-hmm. you can, you see sort of the ups and up, upside and downside mm-hmm. of those things, right? So it yes. makes makes it good for your business, I guess, right? It does. <laughs> so it, it gives does. you a good, good labor pool for and that. And we're happy to provide them with better employment options yeah, than yeah. You know, they would probably have to settle for. The right. local hospitals right. here don't pay um, very high at all. And in fact, um, many of them actually saw the opportunity to actually charge medical students and nursing students for on-the-job experience. Oh, really? Okay. Because they know most of them are just passing through on their way to a job abroad. Ah, And so seeing that their 
hospital experience here locally is just part of their application, mm-hmm. a requirement for them to go abroad. You know, they've taken advantage of that and actually charged for them wow. to work for them, for yeah. their hospital. Right. It's like an unpaid internship almost or a paid you pay. pay to play. Yeah, you know, pay kind to of play. Thing, right? Exactly. Wow, that's wild. All right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, you know what? Let, let's talk a little bit because we, we were speaking, you know, earlier about kind of the the Philippines and kind of the industries that go on here. And, and I think people are, are aware, some people are aware that, you know, offshoring or outsourcing or call centers is like a big part of the the business landscape here, I guess. Yes. Um, and maybe that's what maybe gave you some idea for the business in, in, uh, to start with, which we'll dig into here in a second here. But maybe give people a flavor that don't know about kind of the Philippines and what types of businesses are here and why it makes sense to have call centers here. So the Philippines has really, um, along with India, become the go-to destination for these new industries. Um, initially, it was call centers. So you had your your blue chip company setting up call centers, customer service um, teams here in the Philippines. And it was great. It stimulated a lot of economic growth for the country uh, that started about 15 years ago. I think the banking industry was one of the big industries that started, start, started outsourcing their customer service, for example, right? Yes, okay. yes. It was, well, initially we had your Pacific Bell, your AT&T. Okay. And then you had JP Morgan. Right. We even have Mercedes. Okay. Who is um, offshoring almost all of their accounting internationally. Oh, really? Here okay. to Cebu. Oh, that's interestingly interesting. Interestingly enough. Okay. And so that now brought about the second wave. So first it was voice operations and then it became what they called knowledge process operations where they were utilizing the the skill set here that was available and, and, and cheaper than what international first world operations would have to pay. Sure. And so now we have shared services for a lot of these blue chip companies and they're just located in one place doing functions like, let's say, accounting, as I mentioned, even legal. We have a, a lot of legal teams here that are doing consultation for U.S. companies, mm. um, even Japanese companies, and then healthcare. So we have a lot of telehealth happening now. Um, Here in the Philippines, we have a lot of claims adjusting, insurance utilization. Um, Um, Okay, pretty wide ranging. Yes. yes. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, Mm -hmm. and and the Philippines, I think, is unique in this respect, and maybe India as well, in in that you know English is spoken pretty widely here, right? You learn English when you're going to school here as a as a child, right? In elementary school, is that when you start learning English? Would you say? I would say culturally, more people are speaking English at home Mm -hmm. and they think that their their children are benefiting if the family speaks English at home and so they're getting exposure to English before they even start school I see okay yes yeah yeah. a a lot of the school age kids you even see nowadays are learning the local dialect in school because at home it's really English that's the preferred language oh interesting okay you know I was talking to Aya about this and Mm -hmm. Aya is our, our colleague and She's running this company called MG Schlachter, which is Architectural Services, which, um, as you guys will find out, that's going to be my sponsor going forward here this year. So I just want to give her a little shout out. But she was mentioning to, to me that um, mo- a lot of the language is like the local language is not taught in school. So it's, you know, like you think about learning English, like you, that you're learning the alphabet and reading books and, re- you know, you, it's fo- our education, especially in the U.S., is focused on lang- that language part. Your first, you know, few years in elementary school, right? That the local language here is not taught in schools. It's kind of picked up on the streets, isn't that? Is that's true, right? It's true, um, yeah. and that's because I found that fascinating. Yes, like, what? Like they actually learn English in school here, but the the local language Tagalog or Bisaya is how you say it. Yes, or or Visayan, Visayan specifically sorry. Visayan. Visayan. So, okay. So. The Philippines um, settled on Tagalog okay. as the national language many, many years ago. Okay. Um, but what um, was lost in that decision were numerous dialects. You know, the Philippines is an archipelago. Uh, right. archipelago right. And so uh, the plethora of languages were basically just lost because there was never a standardization I or see. A, a right. formal documentation 
for how do you even spell something in Visayan? There's <laughs> right. no one way to spell anything in Visayan, interestingly oh, enough. Okay. And so a lot of it, like you said, it's just, you know, it's just picked up on the street. Yeah, just handed down, down it's generations. It's just handed down, yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. I saw that. It was just such an interesting kind of thing that pops out at you as a, I guess, a foreigner coming here for the first time and just talking to people and trying to get a feel for the place. Uh, and by the way, it's beautiful here, everybody. So, you know, they're listening out Thank there that you. have uh, been to the Philippines. Um, you know, Manila is very, like, you know, cosmopolitan kind of dense city, you know, kind of just how you would expect it. But as you start getting off into the smaller city, smaller islands, and here on the island, do you call this the island of Cebu or what would you call this island? Cebu is, is an island and it's also its own province. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. I'm trying to learn the terminology here as I go, too. So uh, thank you for that. The province, a province would be analogous to perhaps a state in the U.S. Okay. Yes. And then there's Cebu, Cebu City as well. Okay. So it's all three terms for maybe the same place yeah. <laughs> if you're sitting in the city, I guess. Um, but there's other cities here that are not Cebu. So it's. Yes. Okay. I think we've killed that subject now. <laughs> I'm just trying to like reaffirm it in my own mind trying, trying to figure it out but um, right. uh, okay so thanks for sharing about the, the call center stuff because it's uh, you know I've kind of known that just with business about you know doing engineering outsourcing and you know outsource to certain countries certain countries certain types of things like manufacturing processes you might go to Mexico or China for molding or something like that and you know for call center stuff or these back office uh, processes, you know, it seems like you would come to the Philippines because it makes yes. sense, right? So let's rewind a little bit because now now that you have that understanding, I, w- I want to figure out like how you ended up here because I know originally you're from Los Angeles, California, that's right? right. That's, that's where you grew up, right? Yes. But you're, you've been here now for like 10 years and you're running this business and you're you're, you've been, only been running it for, gosh, what, what, four or five years? Three or? years. Three, three yes. years. Yes. Only three years. <laughs> She's got a whole staff of these highly credentialed people. Uh, she's doing business with these, you know, high-level uh, corporations and, you know, government uh, entities in the United States. And this just kind of happened over the last 10 years, which is kind of a wild thing. And it's really part of, you know, the podcast or the reinvention revolution, as I call it, the, the ability to kind of pivot and keep your mind open and open to opportunities and leveraging, you know, the technology that's at our fingertips now. You know, this whole offshoring thing wouldn't have existed, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. wouldn't have been as easy to run this type of business, right? Exactly. So how did you get here from California? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> well, it's, it's a bit roundabout. Um, okay. I, my mom is really from Cebu, and so okay. I grew up spending summers here. And oh, it's you did? Always, okay. Yeah, it's had a special place in my heart. Okay. Um, I, there's just something about Cebu. It, it's like the small town, but I mean, it's not any longer. <laughs> right, it's um, growing. It, it still has that charm, though, where, yeah. you know, you go to the grocery store and you see, you know, your aunt and your cousins and you run into childhood friends. Um, and, and that keeps us here. But I ended up here uh, and, and ended up starting a business here because I... I frankly just got burnt out. It was 2008. Okay. I was working in public relations in Hollywood. Okay. It's it's crazy. It sounds very cliche. I was telling, as I mentioned earlier, right. over our chat. You know, yeah, so tell me, tell tell people just a little bit about the shoe story. Okay, I think it's kind of fu- I think it's kind of funny. Which is like, you know, you don't you don't think about this when you're getting into a particular industry you or don't. whatever, right? You're just sort of like, oh, that's an opportunity. That's a cool job. That'll be fun. I'll meet cool people. But then it turns into like this crazy story about yeah this my shoe my, one my, day. my devil wears Prada <laughs> story <laughs> right exactly so um you know it, it was a fun job I mean you're, you're from Ohio one of our biggest yes. clients was Victoria's Secret okay so yeah right we right worked from on Columbus the fashion yep. show the Victoria's mm-hmm. Secret fashion the limited show brands right every year mm-hmm. um great group um they were exceptional to work with specifically they had that midwestern values mm-hmm. behind them you know right. they were very friendly people to work with. Other companies, other people that I encountered in that industry, not, <laughs> not so, as not so much. friendly. <laughs> All right. All right. And you know, a couple years into the industry, uh, we were neck deep, and it's a time of year right now. It's funny. It's it's award season. Right, and, award season. Right. You know, yes. everyone gets excited. Oh, the Oscars are coming. Red up. carpet and all this kind of stuff. I still have not really gotten over my trauma. Oh, really? <laughs> award season. <laughs> oh my gosh. So we were the very high profile uh, fashion brand at the time, and what people don't realize is 
how much lobbying happens behind the scenes to get get a product on the red carpet. Oh, right. Okay. A lot of parties are involved. You have PR firms involved. Mm-hmm. You have celebrity stylists involved. You have family members involved. So, you know, it, it gets kind of messy. It's a bit ugly. Um, and, you know, celebrity, um, you, you can't, you just never know what's going to make it on the red carpet. Mm-hmm. You can do everything within your power, within all of your connections to, to lobby for your product to make it. But right. a snap decision at the last minute didn't pan out for us, did not pan out for oh, my client. Right. Okay. Um, so you had this expectation that like, yes, this product is going to be on a particular celebrity. It's going to show up on the red carpet. Yes. You're going to get all this press from it, but didn't quite work Basically, out that way. Basically, we were <laughs> banking on the enough press to ride on for the rest of the year. And that's oh, what wow, an okay. Oscar red carpet um, snapshot will get you. You know, you know <laughs> okay. that Us Weekly who wore it best. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, round right, up, right. the roundup editorials. That's okay. what you want. Gotcha. Um, and, and we lost it at the very last minute. And, you know, in, in times like that, when you, you're a junior executive... Those are the those are the times where you figure out, you know, is this the industry for me? And right. and I quickly realized it was not the industry <laughs> for me. So it was like stressful and you're like, why? It was very stressful. Why does this feel so weird and 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 I didn't right? I didn't have the leadership and the, the mentorship that I needed at that time. And when I zoomed out to be perfectly honest, and I realized I am having an anxiety attack over a shoe. <laughs> You right, know. right. This is not a life and death situation, right? And But then it is in right, the sense right. that you realize you're working in an industry that, I mean, just the, the consumerism, the materialism involved in in what I am losing sleep over, right, right. It, it really led me to to ask myself some very serious questions. <laughs> right. And, and questions that I was not prepared to answer. All I knew was... I needed a complete change of scenery. I needed to pull myself out. I need to pull myself out of LA. I needed to get out of Hollywood. I needed to get out of the industry Mm -hmm. um, because I could no longer determine, you know, what direction to go. And I didn't know up from down. Right. So So. it was a little bit of a breaking point. Did you end up, were you, did you end up just basically quitting your job or how did that happen? I did. I I quit my job. I mean, I gave, I gave notice, but you know, once you, you come to a realization like that, you don't look at anything the same way. Right. You know, you're, I, I, I put in my time, I gave about, I think two more months mm-hmm. and the whole time I just could not look at my, my surroundings the same way. I was right. living in, in Beverly Hills at the time and I had to go to West Hollywood and to our office and mm-hmm. I just was questioning everything. So, uh, you'd already moved on a very mind, drastic probably. move. Yeah. To yeah. Asia was it was exactly what i needed okay yeah so okay so when you come out here did you have relatives here or friends here that you maybe had hap- had made friends with over the years of just coming and summering here or like when you drop in like how what kind of support you know team did you have well yeah we i had a lot of relatives and acquaintances here oh, okay um, but i never really thought of cebu or the philippines as a place where i could consciously intentionally build a, a future for myself and at this point um, you're not really thinking you're an entrepreneur or, or, or are not you? at all okay. not at all you're just like i need to i need to blow out of I town just, man yeah right and so you drop in here and you're like Phew, thank goodness i need to decompress and i'll figure out what's going to happen in the morning right <laughs> well no i was doing that in LA. Okay. <laughs> and I, you know, like I said, I'd given my notice. I was just kind of going through the motions. And then I was talking to a, an uncle who had just moved back to the Philippines from, he had left his job in pharma mm-hmm. in Toronto. I see. Um, because he had been recruited back by a big company here locally. Mm-hmm. And he, he said, Larice, you know, with your work experience, I think you should really take a look at Asia and see what's happening. Mm, okay. This was 2000, this was 2000, I think 2008. And I see. so, okay. you know, sure, whatever. I just need to be on a beach and go right. on vacation. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Right. Let's see. Let's see what's happening there. Uh-huh. And so I, I ended up using an MBA program as a, a good kind of segue ah, to get out okay. of, um, what I was doing to, mm-hmm. to just put a 
nice little punctuation mark on on my career back in LA. I Let me see. Just so you came and, and you went to school in the Philippines, right? Yes. Yeah, so I, I did my MBA at the Asian Institute of Management. Okay. It was actually founded in partnership with Harvard Business School. Oh, cool. A lot of people don't know that. I did not know that. Yeah. So back in the, I think the early 70s, when the Philippines was actually like the darling of Asia, um, right before Marcos kind of went okay. went the wrong way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they set up this business school in Makati, which is the central business district of Manila. I see. And, okay. and there's a very, very good business school there. there it's very traditional business school. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was just so refreshing to be able to apply myself to subjects that I had never thought I would want to explore, like accounting. I see. What was your you degree know? in undergrad? I actually did political science. Oh, interesting. Yes. Okay. I, All right. I, I graduated so from a, UC Irvine, University of California, Irvine, okay. in political science. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's a, yeah, it's a little bit of a change then yes. where you're like getting an MBA is like different i mean even though you were kind of working for a business in some industry you probably had some understanding of you know customers and clients and the on the marketing politics side and marketing and right communications yeah yes. yeah but yeah but diving into an mba from political science is a little bit different right yes um so that's cool so you're learning new stuff and that was a way to i guess also um you could get a visa to be in school so you could stay in the country longer etc right i mean well i don't know what, what kind of challenges it, you have there with with regards to my visa status, since my parents were both or are both still Filipinos or dual citizens. Oh, dual ci- Oh, they are. Yes. Okay. All right. So I was able are you allowed to, to get stay dual here. Citizen, dual citizen, citizen. I can't even say the word citizenship, citizenship yourself, right? Yes. Okay, cool. And so I had no problems um, staying here. Perfect. Yeah. For for school, I didn't have to even process a student visa. It was. Oh fine. wow! All right. Cool. Yeah. So all right. So it was kind of an easy easy transition, you know, relatively, I guess. Yes. Um, all right. So you drop in. Uh, you go to school. You get out of school. And now, what are you thinking? I have this degree. You get a little bit more accl- acclimated to the region. And you know what happens after business school? Every everyone's like, "Where's the biggest paycheck?" Right. You right. know. I just spent all this money on grad school. Right now, you might be in debt even, so you're like, I need some, I need some cash. How do flow. I monetize the learnings? Right, right. And so, of course, I went back to what I knew best. I, I went back to media. I got okay. hired by one of the biggest conglomerates here. It's a, it's a telco company. Um, recruited me to head up media for them. And while we were working out, and 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 interestingly enough, when when that job panned out, that's when my visa status became an issue. Oh, because okay. in the Philippines, and I don't think they're unique in this sense. I think a lot of Asian countries also observe this. To work for a utility company, you must be a citizen. And I was not a citizen yet oh, at that time. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. So it's not like a green card situation, like sponsorship to work. You actually have to be a citizen. You have to be a citizen. That's a little bit different. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. And um, it was funny. We We tried to go through all of the local legit routes Mm -hmm. to process that citizenship yes (laughs) and it took months Uh still no movement right um just a little aside and someone said (laughs) why don't you just fly to la and process it at the the philippines consulate in los angeles right so we did that i I flew there and it took one day (laughs) that's awesome you know what (laughs) <laughs> I, I love this because this is a this is a real tip. I've actually yeah. heard some stories like this before mm-hmm. of, yeah, if you really want to get something done or something processed, especially being a U.S. citizen and you're trying to emigrate or do these types of things, that you really need to do it outside the country yes. that you're trying to go to. Because right? yes. inside it's just they don't... I'm not sure why that is they the will, case. Well, for in my case, you know? they smelled a lot of opportunity. Yeah. So they see, all right, you're a U.S. citizen trying to be one, you know, trying to get your Philippine citizenship. And then number two, you're going to work for the biggest conglomerate in the country. Yeah. We, we, you, you get to grease a lot of palms right now. Right, right. Yeah. They're probably getting to get a big kickback from the company maybe that you're working for. They were really trying to, yeah. Right, yeah. uh, Incentivize. They they wanted us to incentivize them to speed things up a bit. Right. <laughs> so it was in their best interest to slow it down a lot. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So and and that's just how things are. In, how 
yeah, yeah. That's how it is I, I in think Asia. Most countries are kind of like that. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that's a little insider tip there. In, insider tip there. <laughs> Very good. All right, so you so you get that processed. You're working for this big conglomerate media company then, and. How long are you there and what happens? Why did you decide to leave or do something different? So um, amidst all of that, while we were processing the paperwork and, and, you know, companies here, especially big companies, it takes them a while to move. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, things in in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia, one thing people don't realize um, that I learned in business school, did you know the ASEAN is the only like multinational organization that must operate by consensus there's no voting isn't that interesting say that again so they have to all decisions that the asean okay that's the, say, and explain that i know what that is but explain that for everybody the, listening the asean oh gosh now I, I forgot what it stands for but it's it's like the un of southeast asian countries right so know? it's like a, this conglomerate of all the southeast asian countries it's like a is it a political organization or yes. okay yeah yeah. All right, so it's a coalition. It's a coalition, so, right, yes. of all the countries that are in the region, and they agree to you know certain standards and practices, et cetera, right? A lot of it, you know, economic trade agreements, right, things like right. that. Okay, they're the only one that requires consensus. So I see. they don't vote on anything. They all have to kind of come to Everyone agreement to, at some point. Yeah. And and so you can imagine how slowly things move. <laughs> right. So it's like, all right, um, a couple of people aren't in favor. We'll just visit this again next year. And that's more or less wow. how a lot of things traditionally move here in this part of the world. Right. And so much like that, when it came for me to start my job, it took a very long time for this company to mobilize. I see. So I decided, all right, you know, why burn cash? I'm not. I have not started working. I'm not going to keep maintaining my condo in manila Mm -hmm. i'll just go hang out with my parents in cebu which is the second largest city in the philippines right and i'd been here for about a month and i was set up on a blind date and four months later that blind date proposed to me and he's now my husband and we now have three kids 10 (laughs) <laughs> wow. Okay, I did not see that. I did not you see, that, see coming. that coming. Right? <laughs> I, I really see didn't see that coming. Wait a second. Okay, so you so never. So the job never worked out. You, you never started working for so them. So they called okay, me. I did not know this part. All right, it's, awesome. it's, it's funny how the universe works. So right, they right. they called me after waiting for months for them to. I don't know if they had to just like get my office ready or what. My desk. They right, didn't order my right. desk. I I really well, sometimes have no it's like clue. A, the quarterly budget. They're like, oh, we'll hire her next Perhaps, quarter or yeah. something like you know how business works, right? I, some something like that, but yeah. it took months. Right, right. And so when they finally called me, and you know the the universe just has like a sense of humor about it. Right. It was like a week after he had proposed, my husband wow. Wesley had proposed. Okay. And I had to say, you know, I I really I know you're not going to like this, but I've decided to stay in Cebu. Okay. And they weren't happy. They right. really were not happy. Right. But they were calling um, on you at that point. <laughs> but it was a, it was a life changing move. It was right, right. If you want to ask, if someone asks me, um, what was really the turning point for you in really just flipping things upside down and changing your entire approach to life, mm-hmm. or that moment where you felt like the slate was wiped clean, I would say it was at that point. Wow. Okay. It was not when I left LA. It was not when I graduated from business school. Yeah, you were kind of searching. You knew yeah. you knew you needed something different, but you didn't really. You probably were still cleaning out the cobwebs or the whatever those scars or whatever happened back there right totally you're, yeah yeah exactly. okay wow so you get to this point you're like you know what maybe i'm finally ready to really embrace a new life whatever it brings yes right? and i i was i realized i don't want to go back to big corporate i don't want to be back in media ah, okay that was also part of the decision yeah yeah and so sometimes I it think, takes a while to process you yeah. know like in your mind or just experientially right exactly okay. and sometimes it's not always propelled by a knowledge of what you do want to do mm-hmm. but a strong enough conviction of what you don't right want right. to go back to right, right. or what what cycle am i really going to break right now right yeah so you, I, you answered a few questions you're like okay no i don't want that or i want to go this way or whatever yeah okay so so you get married which is crazy you got married and you and now you have three kids right which is wild and this has just happened in the last few years so what was the point at, at what, what point you're still living with your parents or you get married? Like at some point you're thinking like, well, I want to go to work or I want to start a business. How do you get the idea to start a business? And especially since you're not previously been an entrepreneur, 
I mean, I guess maybe getting an MBA might stimulate some more thoughts along those lines, but what was the turning point there? I dabbled uh, after having our first child, I tried out consultancy. So I was working with the European Chamber of Commerce here in Cebu. Um, And it wasn't a bad gig. You know, I was working with mostly European entrepreneurs, businessmen here in, in, in Cebu, and also local business people who were catering to the European market. So it opened my eyes to how international um, business could be just operating out of Cebu. Um, but it reminded me again very quickly that I did not want to work very set traditional business hours. I did not really want to be working for someone anymore um, because I'd been invited to take over as GM of the organization here locally. And so um, I realized, no, I I don't want to be set um, to this nine to five, Monday to Friday schedule because I have kids now. So I, I took time off again and, and wrote business plan after business plan. Every time I'd, we'd encounter idea, my husband and I, we love to bounce ideas off each other constantly. He's an entrepreneur. And so we, we, we do that. That's our thing where we see an idea. We think, how do we apply this here? Will it work? What will it take? Um, and by training, it, it, business school teaches you to just write business plans. Right. <laughs> you true. know, right. yeah. you can't always execute, but you can get it down on a deck and make it look really nice. <laughs> <And Okay>. so, <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. So you got some skills at least or some motivation. Yeah. To, so you uh, know, you background get too to do it. rusty with yeah. at least in terms of getting a business plan down. Right. But uh, I kept backing out after I would pitch it to someone and even if it sounded feasible, something about it would just like stick, you know, in the back of my head, something would say, this is not for you. I see. Your heart wasn't in it, maybe. Yeah. Or, or this is yeah, not yeah. going to improve your quality of life. It always turned out to be very much a quality of life decision. I see. Okay. Um, for me. All right. So some people would say like, who cares? You know, you right. see profitability. There's a market opportunity. Right. Get it. You're right. Right. Go after it worry about quality of life later. Right. But for yeah, us... Yeah, grind it out for three or five exactly. years, right? You know, yeah. But for me, I knew there were some non-negotiables there. I see. Um, and that, that had to fit in from day one. Gotcha. To the business plan. Mm-hmm. And so, how did I arrive at the idea for Cavallo? Yeah. Um, I knew three things. I knew that there was a certain profile of people I wanted to to employ that I could work with. Um, I knew that I wanted to work with the U.S. market. And three, I knew that I needed some flexibility with my schedule. And so knowing that, I was able to pare things down quite quickly from after I had decided that. Um, and then coincidentally, a very good friend of ours who was in the home health industry in in the United States came to me and said, can you help me find an offshoring partner? I oh, cannot okay. find anyone. And after numerous attempts to connect her with existing BPOs here, and it just never panned out, I, I finally said, you know what? If this works out, it would perfectly fit the profile of company that I want to I start. See. Like this has all the makings of what I want to start and create for myself right right so okay. why not give it a shot oh okay so so it was right so she had the insight i guess from being being you're a potential future client of yours yes. right essentially right so your customer is kind of leading you along the path like hey this is what i need can't find what i'm looking for over here she knew you were here right um wow that's pretty interesting so, so yeah i didn't did even start have out? to she the validate first? the market yeah I mean, was she, she the came f- to me <laughs> yeah so that's really cool yeah and then when i i had to answer so that answered the first question you know um is there a market in the u.s that i can work with she's from the u.s all right there you go all right what kind of people would i employ educated english speaking comfortable reporting to an american um people that are educated here in the healthcare industry are from day one mentally preparing themselves to work abroad and to work for Mm. either Americans or work with Americans or work with Australians or Brits. And so it was a great labor pool for me to tap into. Right. 
which maybe culturally, just to explain that a little bit, culturally, if you're if you grew up in Cebu and you speak Visaya or whatever, you may be a little bit more uncomfortable, I guess, speaking a lot of English or working yes. with other Americans, Australians, like yes. you mentioned, right? And 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 speaking is one part of it. Mm-hmm. The other part of it is reporting being managed by okay. a foreigner right um yeah a lot of them have you gotta be the, open to that in your mind and, yes mm-hmm. they they it has the perception of you know your the foreigner boss even though i'm i look filipino i'm very yeah. in their eyes clearly american i see yeah. um in their eyes a foreigner boss is more demanding mm-hmm. you know yeah, maybe it's a little bit scary for them or, yeah, because they be don't daunting. understand. Yeah, yes. it could be daunting, right? That's a good word, daunting, yes. yes. <laughs> okay, I understand. Yeah, Which, not, I don't think everyone everyone would appreciate it. I, I didn't kind of appreciate that before when we were talking about it. I'm like, oh, I could see that, you know. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm thinking it would be like, oh, it might be a great opportunity for them because it turns them on to the world market. But you're right. I think it might be a little bit daunting, like, ooh, I'm not sure I want to get into that. They, yeah, they all, not all would elect for that right. kind of a <laughs> right. they not all would look forward to reporting to that boss every day <laughs> right right it makes sense it makes sense yeah you know someone that's not like not like you it's, it's always a little bit of a challenge i think so uh okay so you get this idea and you kind of how do you get it off the ground though like you sort of like what was the formation or the how'd you get the real real start now you have the idea i think i found a market i think this business is the right style but how do you go about starting it? Like you don't know how to run businesses, really, right? Exactly. So <laughs> At this first, point, you know. first I had to see what does it look like onshore. What does this process look like onshore okay. in the healthcare, the home health agency's office? Okay. Before I could decide how are we going to export this? Are we going to transfer this process, extricate it from where it currently exists, right. send it offshore, and then at what point do we send it back? All right. So like you said, from a supply chain standpoint, where would it make sense to, okay, we cut this off here, the production, send it to this site where they process it further and then send it back. So um, I went I went to Arizona okay. where, where that client was located, is located. Uh, I brought with me a registered nurse. Okay. Who's actually one of my investors now. Mm-hmm. And uh, we sat in their office for a good week. We watched all parts of the business at play, but and then learned specifically about this process, the auditing process, the QA, the quality assurance process. I see. Because at this point, you're not exactly sure what process you, that you're going to make a business out of or try to make, right? You're sort of just trying to understand the landscape overall at this point, right? Yes, Okay. exactly. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to make sure, I mean, the potential client at that point had a very clear idea of what they wanted to send send I offshore. See. Oh, okay. But we wanted to verify that the talent pool here could... Could address it. Could, yeah. Mm-hmm. Could be trained. I mean, they don't know what Medicare is. They don't know what home health is. Right, right. Right? Right, yeah. Um, a very small percentage of hospitals are even on electronic medical records. Oh, I see. A lot of them are still on paper charts. Is this you know going to be... That brings up a, a question in my mm-hmm. mind. So, because you just created this a few years ago, do you have much competition for this little niche of the process? Like, are there other organizations in the Philippines that are doing something similar to you? Or are you standing out for the moment in terms of like, hey, there this are, is different? There are a handful. Okay. But other sectors within the healthcare industry have... Um, been more aggressive about offshoring. I see. So I would say for the home health segment, maybe we're maybe one a of just knit. a few. There are more right now that are doing it for, let's say, workers' compensation. I see, okay. Or maybe the big um, insurance companies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so what we did was we observed the process in-house. What, I see. What is this what does this part of the process look like in-house? Who are they interacting with? Where does it come from? If it's handed off to us, who are we giving it back to? Um, and, and I think what was beneficial from doing that was we weren't relying just on what the client had in mind. Mm-hmm. Because even now, three years later, as we continue to evolve and try to innovate what we're doing, 
I think we always revert back to that stock knowledge of what does this look like from end to end mm-hmm. on the client side? Yeah. And how can we keep proving more and more value to them. And you can only do that if you understand what the big picture looks like for your right, client. Right, right, And if you rely on them for perspective and it's just limited to this little section of the process, you know, if you're making semiconductors, you know, how will you ever move into making the entire handset, for example, right, right, if right. you don't know what the entire process looks like? Exactly, yeah, what I... What I when I talk to people or, or counsel them, you know, with some of the consulting stuff I do, it's, you know, they have to understand their customer's customer. That's how I describe it. You know, you really got to get this big vision picture down. You can't just rely on the that small bit of your immediate customer, what they tell you. You got to think about their customer. Right. And maybe their customer, you know, to really understand where you fit in the value chain and why it makes sense. And, and you know, they might not see something that you can see because they're buried under their work level you know and they're just trying to fight fires you know for, for the moment right exactly yeah yeah cool and a lot of clients come to us and it's it's the ceo or the the decision maker coming to us and really what they're motivated by is cost savings right i want to send this offshore because it's cheaper it's right. too expensive to employ a nurse in-house to do right. this right but where we make ourselves now highly integrated into the organization. We understand the pain points of the clinician. We understand the pain points of the biller, other parts of the organization that we have to coordinate with and that we can improve things for. Right. So that's cool. Yeah. Why that's, that's the right kind of, it's more of like a full service capability, like whatever will help, you know, solve this pain point you're, you're open to designing, right. Or, Or fulfilling. So that's cool. Well, wow. Awesome. Awesome story. <laughs> I mean, I just, it's always fascinating kind of listening to people, how, how they get started, what stimulates their thought process, you know, how they go about it. And one of the things that I always like to ask people when they, when they come on the podcast uh, is, is especially about technology. So this is kind of a tech-based business in terms of, you know, you have to have the right electronic records management software. You have to be using that uh, on your side of the thing. Uh, on your side of the equation, did you have to develop any special software? Or how do you think about technology? I mean, you're not really a technologist in your background in terms of like an IT type of person. Was this type, was that type of stuff daunting you, for you to set up or kind of wrap your head around? <laughs> uh, like, how do you think about that? You know, what's actually, I think what was good um, was that I'm not, in the sense that I'm not a tech savvy person. And so... To keep things simple, so the priority for us was always how do we keep things simple, Mm -hmm. both from a tech standpoint, from a cost standpoint. Um, And because of that, we we narrowed down our client base to one platform. Okay. So we only market, we're very specific. Okay, I love that. We only market to clients who are using one very specific platform. I see. And that made it easy for us, one, to, to, to narrow down... For, uh, from, for marketing, mm-hmm. but also for training. Right, right. right so I don't right. have to teach our teams how to use different, you know, Android versus, you know, iOS. Right, right. We're, right. We specialize just in Android, if I, if I okay. were to make an analogy. Ah, okay. okay, right, 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 right. So that was the first approach that we took to simplify things. Secondly, we, we from day one, we operated everything off Google Drive. Oh, Okay. All our entire process, our whole back end here is Google Drive. So we created um, our work processes, our reports, everything is built from Google Drive. Ah, interesting. Okay. And only two years after we started, did we see the need to bring a developer in and say, okay, we've created all of these work tools oh, off of free I Google see. Drive. Right. Okay. Help us create an an extension, mm-hmm. some, some sort of an, an extension program. It's an right. interface that pops up on their screen that will sync all of these tools that we've created and buy me at least 20% more productivity per person. Wow, okay. And we, if we had attempted to do that on day one, I'm, I know we would have lost a ton of money. We would not have right. even known what we needed. Exactly, You're right, right. And so because, and, and you're actually so how, how did you know to do, to do this? Because I think this is really an important point. Uh, and a lot of businesses I, I see and work with don't quite understand this. You know, like I'm more of the, the mindset of, 
you know what, down and dirty, just get it going, use an Excel spreadsheet, use the Google Drive, right? But the, the important thing is to get started and learn about what you're really, how valuable your offering is and how you're solving people's problems, right? right. That infrastructure can come later. Exactly. Right? exactly. So how did you know how to do that? I mean, was that just natural or are you, or are you just like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to start this way. <laughs> well, I, I, I think... I have to give my husband credit for that because okay. he's an entrepreneur right. and he he's all about lean everything. Okay. You know, right. before he will pay for it, he will fully explore what are the free options. I see. <laughs> and then if he does have to pay for it, what are the workarounds right. so that he doesn't have to buy the whole thing, right, you right, know? Right, right. And so he was a, a big influence when we first started the company. And and the good thing is we started with one client and it was a client that was a friend. And so it was very collaborative from day one. I had a team of five when we started out. And so there was no pressure, you know? Right, it was right, like, let's right. just figure out what we're doing. Let's just learn the industry first before we... Add all the bells and whistles. Dump a lot of money into, you know, yeah, upfront development, to right? complicate. Things. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. So. Well, I think it's great. It's right, right on the nose for me. You know, that's how, that's how you should approach things. So cool. Um, okay, so my, my next question is, you know, in, in, in thinking about your recent experience, and it's only been three years since you got this going, and you dove into the Philippines, and, uh, you know, what's interesting to me is, how do you keep your mind open or continue to keep your mind open to, to change or reinvention or to pivoting or, or you know, like, how, how do you see the future? And, and um, I guess, how do, you, how do you keep your mind open to change? One thing that... I've realized in in my three years yeah. of entrepreneurship is you have to give yourself um, that mind space. And so as we've grown, and we've grown a lot faster than I had anticipated. So we're, we're now at 10 clients in the U.S. We, our team has reached 65 people. 65, wow. Yes. Okay. Um, and we're we're consciously trying to now slow down our growth this year, just while we catch up in terms of process improvements. Okay. Um, and improving the way we do things here, not just um, from a productivity standpoint, but even just an organizational development standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in terms of that, to answer your question. Um, it's very easy when you're too entrenched, I think, in the day-to-day -day, um, to get caught up in all of the, the urgent must-do-it-now, right. must-address-it-now issues that come up in, in a company. Um, and what I've had to make conscious time for is to just zoom out, you know, look at things from a bird's eye perspective. And that has required me to, yes, equip people to handle the day-to-day, -to, -day, to handle the urgent stuff. Right, right. You know, the, the client emails that pop up at 20, you know, 24 hours around the clock. Um, because I was not any more able to zoom out and see the future of the company or to even right. see how do we get longevity out of our people, you know. Mm. Um, yes, as I mentioned, there's a very ready talent pool for us to employ here, but many of them are in transit. They're on their way to go work abroad. Oh, I and see, so right. how do we crack that? How do we entice them to stay here longer mm -hmm. or to rethink their careers right. and maybe look at this as a long-term career option rather than just a stopover? Right, right, right. And so that those are things that we're trying to address, and I think if we can crack it, um, we don't need to just stop at, home health we don't need to stop at qa we don't need to stop at coding that's what opens the door for us to look at higher level work now oh i see okay right because right now we're uh, from a turnover standpoint we're looking at average about 16 months to about two years 
okay for for our people because right. most of them have plans to go abroad i see and so how do we transform this talent pool and ultimately transform the potential of this industry so so keeping some space out there to kind of Giving, do, that, do yeah. that strategic thinking or yes getting above the fray right exactly exactly okay. yeah. and that's really what i have had to consciously put more effort into as as an as a as a ceo as right. a founder right i got you yeah, yeah. Well, it, it makes sense because yeah keeping yourself out of the fray like i I talk about space kind of in general a little bit on the past few episodes of it's just good in all ways to like power down a little bit, uh, you know, zoom out, like you said, and um, just really think like, is this the right, am I on the right track or not? Because, you know, can this, this adjustment now of just a half a degree, you know, three years from now is really a big deal, you know, where, where if you don't zoom out and you don't make that little adjustment, it's like all of a sudden it's like, wow, what, what just happened? You know, maybe things crater later on or something, right? Exactly. So cool and interesting. Well, I, I want one final question for you. Um, now that we're, we're starting to sweat here a little bit, at least I am <laughs> in your office because we turned your air conditioner off. You're in the tropics. is no, not right. a polar vortex. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, and I'm not complaining. Believe me, I'm not complaining, but um, just feeling the heat a little bit. Uh, and that is, okay, my last question is, uh, can you share with everybody a reinvention revelation, something that you could not have predicted, uh, that you wouldn't have known or whatever before you got into this, before you dropped into the Philippines, before you decided to like out of thin air create this new business? You know, what have you learned about yourself or about business that you can share with everybody? I think what the 10 years have really taught me um, is that you can absolutely create your reality around you. You don't need to physically leave the country actually (laughs) that you live in. I'm not saying that you have to move halfway across the world to a new country in order to, you know, pursue what you want to do or create the life that you want to live or exercise or pursue a new talent. Mm -hmm. Um, But you have to be prepared to start from scratch. And I think what I had to do was leave the expectations, the pressures, my mm, attachments right. to those former lives that I had, those former careers, those former um, desires that I, or, or ideas that I had for a future for myself, you know, right, which... Right. In my case, I had to physically, geographically move, right? right, right. But I don't think you need to. Okay. But I think you need to really, there's a huge detachment process that, I think that's number one. Yeah. And then you build, you build from there. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the non-negotiables? Have once, in your detachment process, what are now the non-negotiables for the new life that you do want? And then you have to be prepared to just start from scratch. Like I could not have probably built what I've, created here if i still had an attachment to you know celebrity culture right right, right. or you know or, media, or, or being nervous not media. being in the u.s as yes. an american or something right you know there's all these probably thoughts that you have in your mind like you just have to kind of make the leap sometimes right absolutely yeah absolutely and push yourself out of your comfort zone you will never regret taking those risks it will only teach you something new about yourself Mm -hmm. um and like i said you you either walk away with a stronger conviction of what you do want to do or at least a knowledge of what you don't want to (laughs) do which will still help you on your path and they're both yeah both super valuable i think yeah i I totally agree uh well awesome larissa has been uh great having you on the podcast today thank you people are interested in learning more about cavallo or getting in touch with you, what would you tell them? Where, where should they go? Well, they can start at our website. Okay. It's cavallo.com. Okay, Q- can you? Yes, it's Q-A-V-A-L-O.com. Okay. Check us out. Um, if you're in the home health industry, looking for quality assurance, looking for some coding services, um, or just overall uh, want to talk to someone about how can you restructure your team and avail of offshoring capabilities Mm -hmm. um reach out to us we'd love to hear from you okay sounds good well i really appreciate it and all that information will be in the show notes so look for it there if anybody needs to find it you can go to jim jim's reinvention 
Larice, thanks again. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for listening to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more, join our mailing list at jimjimsreinventionrevolution.com. See you next time. And remember, the revolution has just begun. So dig in, embrace the process of reinvention, and start realizing the success you've always dreamed of. Hey, revolutionaries, if you enjoyed today's episode and today's guest, let them know by commenting on their Facebook page, finding their Twitter handle or Instagram feed, and letting them know you heard them on Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And tell them what you got out of the episode, what you really liked, or how they inspired you. I know they would get a kick out of it and will help others find the same value that you found.